Welcome to No Greater Love, an audio outreach of Westminster Calvary. Please grab your Bible and join with us as Pastor Jeff teaches through the Gospel of Matthew. Well, note takers, uh, if you're jotting notes down this morning, I've titled today's message, Inside Out. Kind of a weird title, Inside Out. Well, over the course of the last few weeks, we've seen that that Matthew has gone to this place where he has dealt with the certainty of Christ, that he has dealt with the sufficiency of Christ. He's dealt with the response that you and I are to have towards Christ. And we know that, that Matthew was writing to the Jews, and as he wrote to the Jews, he was expressing them and pr- trying to capture their attention, if you will, regarding who Jesus was, that he was the Son of God, that, that, that he was the long-awaited for Messiah that the Old Testament Scripture spoke about. By a show of hands, who knew that? Well, most of you guys should raise your hand because we've been here for a few weeks. We've talked about that, right? Well, the great thing about it is, is that as we transition here into this, we can look back and we can see that, that Jesus has gone through these three distinctive encounters, that, that he encountered disaster on the Sea of Galilee, that he was there in the fisher boat with some guys that were professional fishermen that were used to being out on the sea. And as they were out there, guess what happened? A storm arose, so much so that these professional fishermen, they went to this place where there was fear within their heart, and they began to cry out, Lord, save us, we perish. We went on, and we saw last week that that Jesus, after he went through that storm, he crossed over the Sea of Galilee, he came to the shorelines, and there he was met by two demon-possessed men. It's kind of weird. You know, we're sitting here talking about demons, yes. The spiritual realm within the scriptures is absolutely there. And yet Jesus did a work in their life. He was able to command and to send the demons out of these guys. And he set these two men free. Now we come to today. We get to the third D, which is disease. And here we have the, a guy that is paralyzed. A guy that is struck with palsy, if you will. Palsy in, in, uh, in the New Testament time was known by five different things. There was five different types of palsy. This particular one would, would remove that sensation of feeling from the extremities. And it would, it would move on, and it would actually take away the movement, if you will, of the extremities. Couldn't move. So this guy, you know, what would we call that today? Quadriplegic, right? You know, he's, he's completely immobilized. We find here in Matthew chapter 9 that this storyline here that we dive into that it presents a spectacular work of God. And, and, and Matthew highlights this, Mark highlights this, and Luke highlights this. And he brings it to the forefront. We find that there was a crowd of people that were gathering around and they were in this place where they were watching. As Jesus spoke a word of forgiveness, the first thing that comes out of his mouth as he's dealing with this guy that was paralyzed is a word of forgiveness. And that word of forgiveness, it spilled out into other areas of his life. And, and Jesus finally gets to that place. He says, Take up your bed and walk. And he sends them home. And guys, Jesus deals with us in the same way. He comes to that place and so often the very things that he wants to deal with, the first things that he wants to deal with is getting our hearts right. That, that place of forgiveness, coming to him in forgiveness, letting him touch us, letting him remove that. He does this. He works on the inside of us. That working is through the moving of his spirit, through the conviction of the spirit. And he he works inside of us. And the results that are born out from that is fruit within our life. There's fruit that spills out of our life. And, And when that fruit comes out, it's on display for everybody to see. It's not just something that you and I just kinda got our black trench coat on I'm selling some watches, you know. I, hey, look at this banana, you know. No, 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 no. The, the, the fruit that comes out, it's on demonstration because there's a change and the outside world recognizes that change. They see it. It's a powerful thing. Well, as we go here into this section of Scripture, I want to make sure that I catch us up and I know that we've got, we've got those that are in here um, studying to be pastors in this room and so I, I, I like to break this down and to give, you know, uh, a little greater detail in some points. So as we dive in today, Bible students, every one of us is Bible students, look back to Matthew 8, verse number 34 as we start today. We went through last week, we read this last week, Matthew writes, and behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus, 
And when they saw him, they begged him to depart from their region. All right, Jesus is in there doing a good work, right? He sets two guys free. He sets them in their right mind. They see him in the marketplace. He, they're sitting there clothed. You know, they'd run through the hillside naked for years at a time. And now these guys are sitting there clothed and in their right mind. The response that Jesus got from the outside world, as fruit was coming forth from these guys' life like that, the response was, oh, no, 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 no. Not so much Jesus, let us ask you to leave. No, they begged Jesus to leave. They begged him to get out of here. And we go into verse number one, chapter nine, verse one. So he got into a boat, he crossed over, and he came to his own city. Now that's the end of the scene from last week. It ties it off right there. You know, our Bibles show a new, a new chapter break there, if you will. Not in the original. It ends there. And now we transition to verse number two, which carries our study today. Then behold, they brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. This starts the new scene. And I wanted to uncover this scene as we lay the foundation in this with some of the parallel passages that are coming out of the other Gospels. So flip to your right. If you can keep up, great. If not, just recognize the verses that are there. Uh, Matthew, or excuse me, Mark chapter 2. And in Mark chapter 2, we find in verses 1 and 2 that Mark says this. And again, he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately, many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And what did he do? What does the text say? Right in your Bibles, Mark chapter 2, verse 2, at the end of it, it says, And he preached the word to them. He came to that place and he preached the word to him. We know that this area of Capernaum is a place where Jesus, he set up and he instituted as the home base for his operation of ministry. We know that, that coming out of Matthew chapter 8 and verse number 14, that scholars believe that as Jesus was in Capernaum, that the, the place that he would stay would be at Peter's house. We found that as we were in Matthew 8 and 14, that, that Jesus went there. And all these crowds of the city, they, they populated around and they came and they pressed on the door and they, they came in and they wanted to see Jesus. And so they, the, the scholars say that the area of Capernaum had a population of about 10,000 people. So there's quite a few folks, if you will, were kind of squeezing in around the mud hut or whatever it was there. Um, well, let me add to this a little bit more. We're going to flip to the, the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 5, verse 17. Dr. Luke, he writes here a little bit different. He says, Now it happened on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee Judea and Jerusalem and the power of the Lord was present to heal the people that were here the people of the town but also there was the professional religious people there the Pharisees and the teachers of the law the people that were well versed if you will in the Old Testament scriptures and gang as they were there they watched and they looked upon Jesus and everything that he was doing with a critical eye and it was in this critical eye that they were there to, to, to contradict or to critique or to be the, the naysayers of all that Jesus was doing. When that fruit was coming out of people's life, you find that the Sadducees and the Pharisees were not focused upon the greatness and the goodness of what God was doing based on the historical prophecies of who Jesus was. But they were so focused upon their own works, their own things, that when Jesus did a good work, they were always the naysayers. Jesus works in our lives, gang. Okay? And as he works in our lives, it seems like invariably that the enemy will take somebody and he always manages to get somebody right before your face to contradict you or to stir things up or to say, you know what, no, 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 it can't be like that. Do you not remember your past? Do you not remember where you came from? Do you not remember that you did this and this? And they're always going to that place to drag us back, to point out the things that Jesus has covered over. And the scriptures would tell us to forget those things. Philippians, Paul would tell us, Forgetting those things which are behind and pressing forward towards the upward call of Jesus Christ. We're to go forward. God is up to a work in our lives, gang. And no matter how many naysayers arise on the scene or into the 
your social circle or your relationships. It doesn't matter how many naysayers are there. God's work will continue on. The Bible declares to us firmly that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And it brings us great hope, tremendous hope. Now we can walk away from Jesus, no doubt. We have the freedom of that. He will not violate our free will. The Bible in the book of Romans in chapter eight would tell us that there is nothing that can snatch us out of his hand. We're safe in his hand. And as we find here in Luke, at the end of verse number 17, that all these religious folks were there, and yet, the very last sentence, it says, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. God's power there to heal was present. Jesus was there, and he was so willing that all would come to him and that he would be able to touch. And I think it's, it's worthy of reminding us, guys, that the same is true for us. We've got the epistle of Ephesians. And as we go through the epistle of Ephesians, it declares to us the richness that Christians have in Jesus. The power of God's spirit is present with us too. And it allows us access to his help. The book of Hebrews would tell us, uh, Hebrews 4 and 16, it would say, come boldly to the throne of grace. Why? That I might be able to receive help in that time of need. Help. Now, this does not mean that, it's a, that, that every moment of your life is, is, is in the ditch and it's drudgery and it's all this stuff. But what it does mean is we have decisions. And God is willing to help us and to lead us. Now, in this story, we find that there's a, a radical inter- intervention. In fact, back in Mark uh, chapter 2, verse 3, Mark pens, he says, Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. So as the story unfolds, as the scene gets a little bit thicker, we, we find that, that Jesus is here in Capernaum, that at Capernaum, he's staying at Peter's house, and at Peter's house, all of this is commotion is happening, that you've got the population of 10,000 people, if you will, pressing down in and around his house. And we've got, in the background, beginning to develop here, we've got these four men that are mentioned, and they bring their friend to Jesus. This guy with the palsy, this guy that was a quadriplegic, This guy that could not move, that he didn't have the the sensation of feeling within his extremities, his arms and his legs, and his body was just immobile. He couldn't do anything. It was the friends that did the work. Practically, gang, if we were to stop the Bible study right there, there is enough daily bread in that, just stopping right there, for us to sit here on it, to meditate and go, Lord, speak to me regarding this. Speak to me regarding these three verses here and what was going on with these guys and their, their friend. Because guys, we're to do the same thing. We are to bring our friends to Jesus. The people that we interact with, not everybody that you interact with is Christians. I know sometimes we think that, right? Well, I, I do. And sometimes I just take it for granted because I get to see your guys' smiling face. I go, oh, they're all Christians. Praise the Lord. We're on the same team. Woo-woo. And then I walk out the door and go, hey, I'm in a hostile world. What happened here? I thought we're all, can't we just get along, you know? Group hug, you know? No way, man. It doesn't, it, it's not like that. You know, one of the things that I, I like to, to share and stir up the mind of the, uh, you know, the few folks that help out in leadership here is, is, is that I like to encourage them in the area of praying for people. And I say, pick five people that are in your life. Not your church friends. That's a given. Pick five people that are in your life. Is there a magic number with five? No, it's just the number of fingers that I have on my hand. So five, pick five people and pray for them. Pray for five people within your family. Pray for five people within the scope and the sphere of your influence. Why? Because you're bringing people to Jesus. And it's, we we trip out about this works of service and yet there's tremendous opportunity. We can be cruising down the road and there it is, all of a sudden, five. five. You're gonna go around this week, five. Got here five, you know? Everybody went to Arby's, five dollars for five sandwiches or whatever. Yeah. I don't eat there, by the way. That's for people with five, so I don't have five. <clears throat> I got ten, so I go there twice. <laughs> so, listen, people need the love of Christ, and we're to bring people to God in prayer. And God uses the positions of influence that we have. Your places of employment, the 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 leagues or the things that you get involved with outside of work, all of this stuff. And I want to show you how powerful it is, okay? 
because we, so often we minimize what we do and we just come to that place where we just kind of blow it off. It's like, yeah, come on, really? Really, Pastor? Yeah, really. Follow with me to the Old Testament, uh, the book of 2 Kings. And if you can't find it or you can't flip there, um, the person next to you should know. So 2 Kings chapter 5, as you're flipping there, I'm just going to read it out for illustrative purposes only, okay? Now it says this. It says, now, Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and an honorable man in the eyes of his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. He was a leper. And the Syrians had gone out on raids, and he brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel. And she waited on Naaman's wife. And then she said to her mistress, now this is this young captive girl that was taken from Israel. She said to her mistress, which is Naaman's wife, if only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. Guys, I want you to understand in a very simple way, in, in, in a very easy application point, is that as we bring our friends to Jesus, that God has left it to us and he's put each one of us into a place of influence. This young girl was held captive by the Syrian army, you know, marched out of Israel, if you will, and there she sits in the, the dude that took them captive, and guess what? Influence. Influence for the purposes of God, right there in the middle of that. And the same thing happens to us, guys. That God has given us influence, and we need to walk that influence out. We need, to, we need to use it for what it is. It might be a small word. It might be a consistent prayer. It might be, watch, practical application stuff here. I personally do this, so I'm just sharing my, what I do. It might be a text to somebody once a month, still praying for you. And I'm telling you what, man, you're going to get blocked. But it's true. It's true. Once a month. I got on the roll. There's, you know, I've got eight folks. I'm doing this to once a month. <laughs> I, I don't mean to laugh facetiously like, aha, I gotcha. But I am taking you to Jesus. And what does that mean? Uh, clean heart, pure hands. For me, first, there's an there's a immediate benefit for me. Second benefit is this, is that God is faithful to answer the cries. He is. I don't know what he's going to do. I have no idea. But I know this, that the influence that we have, that we can pray for people, those that have become stubborn and resistant to Jesus, those that are hurting and they're so far down that they can't move in their situation. It's up to you and I to come, to intervene, to interact, to pick them up and to carry them to Jesus. And we do that one way. is by prayer. Now we must remember that the power of God was present in this situation to heal. That God wanted to do something here. Flip back to Mark chapter 2. We pick up in verses number 4 and 5 as we're still going forward. And Mark says, And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on, on which the paralytic was lying. So the scene is this. We've got all these folks crowding around the house and he can't get in there. These four buddies can't take their, their friend that is paralyzed and get him into the house. There's too much stuff happening. Now, at, at this particular time, um, you know, during Jesus' time and, and the homes here um, during this era, you know, they were flat roofs. It's not like they've got this, you know, big A-frame that is built up or this crazy two-story thing that they're working off. The roofs were flat. And so what happened is, is these dudes take, took their buddy, they went up on the roof, Start running down. Okay, all the crowd is gathered here. They get to the doorway of that place. Okay, this is the house. And for the mud and the sticks and the moss and all that stuff that they put on there and, and um, kind of allowed to sit, if you will, in the sun, it become a hard surface. Well, they start digging through this. So it didn't happen like this. I mean, yeah, they were instant in what they were doing, but it took some time and it took some effort. And we're reminded that when we bring people to Jesus, that guess what, gang? It's going to take time and it's going to take effort. There's time and effort that is involved. The dudes that Jesus used to get a hold of my heart, bless their hearts, these dudes had it bad because I was a resistant, I was stubborn as a mule, man, kicking like a donkey, you know, and I would run from these guys. I'd be showing up at parties and here comes the Christian club after Jeff. It's like, what are they doing here? 
go up on the roof, jump out the window. Literally, I would go up on the second floor and jump out the window. I was doing things I shouldn't be doing, or at least in their eyes I shouldn't be doing them, right? But we have to go after those folks, and, and not in an intimidating or harassing way, but in, but in the way of the sincerity of heart that we want to bring them to Jesus. This message is more dear to my heart right now because I have my grandmother, as I've told you, that she's at that place where it's time for her to step into eternity. And so for me, in the preparation of this message, it spoke to me in a way that, that I could emotionally grab hold of it. Because, listen, we take for granted what it is that Jesus has, got, has, has, has brought to us, has, has given us, this get the salvation. We take it for granted until... Late in the night, that accident happens and we get the call. Until we go to a family, a friend, a loved one. We tell we go to their funeral. Until these things are brought back to the surface and then suddenly we realize that, wait a minute, what did I just do? I've just spent X, Y, and Z not living for Jesus. We're to invest wisely in the kingdom of God, if you will. Well, again, um, here in Mark, uh, verse number five, it says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. They work, they applied effort to get their friends to him. And it reminds us of this. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, somewhere in the area of verse 7, it would tell us, Paul would, would indicate to us that some plant and some water. But it's Jesus is the one that gives the increase. It's not us, Jesus does it. But we plant and we water. Now Jesus sees these men and their faith in verse number 5. Jesus saw their faith. And he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. Faith. Now in, in the epistle of James in chapter 2, verses 14 down through 20, that James would write to us and he would tell us that, hey, what does it profit, my brother? And if some says that he has faith but he does not have works, can faith save him? And we're not going to exegete the, those verses and, and kind of pull out what it means. But very simplistically, as we go through it, James, he lays it out there. He says, listen, man, if you, if you see somebody that is naked and destitute of daily food, and you just come up to him and say, hey, the Lord bless you, and then you just cruise on your way. It's like, what? Uh, no, that didn't help, you know? You didn't do anything there. Verse 17 there would say, thus also faith by itself, if it is... If it does not have works, it's dead. And we get to that word dead and we completely miss it. Because we think, oh, there it is. Well, I'm not saved. And we stomp our feet. Ah. You know, what's this pastor doing? Putting a trip on me. No, 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 no. The word actually means useless. And if you look in some of, uh, I'm seeing Bibles here. So in some of your Bibles, the, it's going to be defined. There might be a little asterisk next to it and a footnote down at the bottom. It says useless. So faith by itself, if it does not have works, is useless. Now, who wants to be useless in the master's hand? Not me. I want to be a vessel of honor, not of dishonor. I, I, I want to be something that is coming and saying, okay, Jesus, you want us to bring our friends to you. Here it is. Listen, my prayer life needs to grow. And guess what? The growth in that prayer life, it can start right at home with nobody else knowing. My wife doesn't know. My kids don't know. It's just me and Jesus. And Jesus, here it is. Here's the guys I'm going to pray for today. You know, and you bring the list. Of, we're carrying our friends to Jesus. And they, this dude took action, man, back in Mark. These four friends, they took action. And I want to give you um, another example of this because it's, it's something that's happening in my life right now in real time. Um, you know, many of you know that you know, I got motorcycle riding in my veins. That's just me. I grew up on a motorcycle. Uh, my first motorcycle I got when I was about six years old, it was a... For those of you that remember the 70s, the little ATC 70s, those little three-wheeler things, dude, those were awesome. And I crashed it virtually every time I got on it. I was too small. But I started riding then, and nothing has changed. Over the course of the years, you know, I got into professional racing. Uh, let me retract that. I got right at the threshold of professional racing. I said, ah, I don't think so, and I did something else. I went to school. So, but, but motorcycle stuff has been in my, my vein. I've had... Tons of motorcycles over the years, dirt bikes and street bikes. Now, more recently here, um, I've had this desire to just 
be pouring out into other people. You guys heard me say this time and again. It's so easy to interact with non-believers. I like it. I, I enjoy interacting with non-believers. It's easy. There's no judgment. You come to the house of God, and it's like people are going, did you see that guy? He wore the same plaid shirt last month. And he's not wearing his boots today. That's why I'm so short. I've got my regular shoes on. Yeah. But the desire of heart to share with other people, gang, it's real and it's there. And so me and somebody else is sitting in this room. I won't tell you who, but um, we've got a few motorcycle riders that are in this room. And we've been working with some dudes back in Washington. There's a church plant thing that we're working on back there. And these guys ride motorcycles. So they're going to come and visit you this summer. But there's also a group here that's locally that rides motorcycles. And so me and my friend here in this room, we went and we went over and we crashed their party the other night. Actually, it wasn't a party. It was a meeting. A one-hour meeting. We went and crashed their their meeting thing. And they, uh, um, they had heard about me because I ran into some of the guys around town and was just talking to them. And they asked, well, what do you do? I said, well, I'm a pastor of a church over here in Westminster. Oh, okay. So I went there and I was sitting down in the, uh, at the table and, and uh, the welcome gal came over and welcomed us and kind of signed us on this little list to say that we were there. And she says, oh, I heard about you. You're that pastor guy. Now listen, listen, listen to this. She goes, Maybe we could have you give us one of your little talks. And you know what I said? I'm casting the big deep sea pole. I'm going, yep, 160 people. We're going to talk to these dudes. We're going to go and share Jesus with these guys. That's the whole point. That's the whole point. And it's a very practical thing. And so we're sitting there. And it only lasted, this interaction that we had only lasted for an hour. And we're sitting there, we're going, I'm going in my mind, I'm seeing the dude at the, kind of at the back side door, he's, not back, the front side door, and this guy was talking, and I'm going, dude, I do not want to talk to that guy, oh no, that's not the right one, guess the one, guess the one that Jesus gave me, that dude needs Jesus the most, <laughs> and so yesterday, we connected with this guy in a powerful way uh, for several hours, and um, the work has already started, and so I hope and I, I, I hope and I pray that we see this dude in here sometime over the course of the next several months or so. I, I don't know what time frame it's going to take. But he's a guy that needs Jesus. And God has given us favor with him. Uh, the Bible tells us in Psalm 103 and 3, it says, The Lord who forgives all of your iniquities and who heals all your diseases. That's the Old Testament scriptures. That's the book of Psalms. And yet we're finding this to be very real here as these guys brought their friend to Jesus. Matthew 9 and 2, Jesus said that your sins are forgiven. This is what he told the guy. He went right to that place and he dealt with removing the, um, the root cause, if you will, of what was going on. He said, your sins are forgiven. Jesus, do you not see that we just let this paralyzed guy down through the roof? He can't move. Who cares about his sins right now? Let's just get this dude moving again, okay? And Jesus dealt with the root cause. He dealt with the core of what was taking place. And he didn't go to that place of removing the symptoms. The symptoms were the external things in this man's case. Not in all cases, but in this particular guy's case. And gang, we do the same thing because Jesus desires to deal with the root. And we often run to him in this place where we're debilitized in some regards, where we're disabled, if you will. And we want Jesus to bring relief to our circumstances. We don't want him to bring that new heart and to deal with the core issue of what it is that goes on within us. We just want him to handle the peripheral stuff. The inside out. God works on the inside and it manifests itself on the outside. As God deals with the root of the problem, the external will take care of itself. Just like in this guy's life. Psalm 119 and 67 says that before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. Listen, the mission of Jesus as we see it revealed here in the Gospels and it, as it is today in yours and mine life is that Jesus has come to deal with our sins. He, he has come to forgive us of our sins. He's come to, to seek and to save that which is lost. And in case you think that you walk with Jesus for a time and a season and that you get any better, please don't be mistaken. Your righteousness is as a filthy rag. It's, it's still disgusting before God. There's nothing all the days of our life that we bring to the table. It's only Jesus. And he comes and he deals with our sins. And we find back here in, in Mark 2 and 10 that Jesus says, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. And he said this to the paralytic. 
And I find that this is completely interesting because so often we find with, I find within my own heart and my own life that there are those times where I wrestle with doubt. And so often, even ministering here at this fellowship, I talk to so many people that wrestle with doubt. Now, they might not express it as doubt. It might show up in something else. But Jesus did a work here on the inside, and it spilled over to the outside. And the purpose behind all of this is that you may know, that you and I may know. We've got this assurance, or we have this confidence of knowing that these things that are written, that they're written for us. The assurance of faith. And it takes away, knocks down that, that strong men of doubt in our life. You know, as we recognize the power of Jesus, our hope grows. It should never stop growing. It should grow, season in and season out. Well, like always, the clocks run fast here in this building. Same with my watch. Every time I'm in this building, it just goes fast. Let me, uh, uh, let me close with this. Flip over to, to Luke 5, also the, uh, you know, Luke, Luke's version of this. Um, in Luke chapter 5, I see verses 24 and 25. Again, Luke writes what Jesus said. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he rose up before them, took up what he'd been lying on, and he departed to his own house, glorifying God. Gang, there's three things for us to do here in this. There's three things that he gives the instructions to this man to do. He dealt with the, the, the core or the root cause. He dealt with that stuff on the inside, which ultimately showed itself on the outside. But he tells him to arise. He calls him to a place of action. Arise. We would know this, that as Jesus dealt with the man with the withered hand, he would tell him, stretch out your hand. Not only is it a direction and something to exercise and to do, but it was also a step of faith. Because if you'll remember with me, think back in your life, that if you've ever had any, any type of injury in some capacity, that, that you will get to that place where you're hobbling around on crutches or something like that. And what goes on to the muscle in that ankle, that knee, that leg, or whatever? Just a few short weeks, it's like, what happened? These pants fit again. I look pretty good now, you know? No. It, you know, the, the muscle shrinks and, and the tenants become weak and all that stuff. This guy, when Jesus spoke to him, rise up, arise. Reminds me of something. That as we step out in faith, we do have to step forward. In the book of Exodus, as Jesus, as, as the Father, as the Holy Spirit spoke to Moses, Exodus 14 and 15, the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. Lord, don't you see the Egyptian army that's coming after us? Lord, don't you see right before us that there is the, the great Red Sea? The Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. In other words, get off of your knees and get moving. We do spend time taking people to Jesus, but then there arises and we reach that point where we must take up our bed and we must go forward. And this man was called to that, to arise, to take up of his bed, and to go to your house. So he sent him back home. And so it tells us something here as we go back home. Gang, sometimes you and I, we get stuck. This man got stuck. But in verse 25, right here in our text, Luke 5 and 25, the Lord tells him, says this dude departed to his own house and he was glorifying God. And I want to encourage you guys in the same thing. That you would take the healing of God that we get from his word, that you would take it back to your house. And as you take this home, as you go out the doors here of the sanctuary, as you head home, that you would take these words and that you would remember what Jesus has said. And that you would begin to pass them on to your children, to your grandchildren, and to those that you have influence over. The children within your house, remember parents, that we're to teach our kids how to pray. It's simple. We often forget it. Moms, dads, if we were to ask your children something about you today, would they say that you're a man or a woman of prayer? 
Yeah, when we hit problems, my, my mom and dad, they pray. Do your children know that about you? Listen, if they don't, they should. We're to teach our kids how to read the Bible. We're to teach our kids how to serve. We're to teach our kids how to devote their time. And guess what? To even how to give of their finances, their money. These are part of the things. This is just Christian living, gang. You know, we, we get adult folks that come into the church. They never have these things. I didn't have them. But Jesus desires to teach. And the, and the earlier that we apply these things and we walk them out, I think the more pliable the heart is. Because it seems like invariably that with the passing of age, the harder the heart gets. If we're a Christian, that shouldn't be. But it does happen. Oh, I've seen that before. Oh, I've heard that before. I said we were going to close, so this is the second close, and we got to close. I mean, we got to wrap this up here. We're late. <clears throat> and I say that every week. You just would just you'd think that I would do something like positive and long, you know, make the service longer, Pastor. I wish I could. <laughs> that's the that's the pressure of being in the the rec center here, right? We can't can't elongate our time. So, um, remember this as we instruct our our children in the faith. We also want to be very careful, gang, that we practice what we preach. Because it seems like if anybody can sniff this out, it's the kids. You might be able to, to, to hoodwink them here while they're little. Okay. But there's going to come a time where they become teenagers. And if they haven't seen you doing it, they are going to call you on the carpet. And it's not going to be easy because it's going to happen in the middle of a crowd and all kinds of people around. And you're going to put your tail between your leg and your face is going to turn red. So let us teach them early. Boy, that was a heavy call to action right there. That was tough. Listen, don't pretend. We're not perfect people. We need to share our failures as well as our, our victories with our children. But we need to teach them, gang. It's your responsibility. They're in your house. You teach them. And even if they're not in your house and you have children, you still need to teach them. It's your Thanks for joining us today. If you want to know more about having a real relationship with God, Click the Do You Know Him link under the Resources tab at WestminsterCalvary.org. We also would like to encourage you to join us Sunday mornings at 9 or 1030. For more information, please contact our church offices at 303-223-4640. Thanks and God bless.